Okay, so let us carry on with the fifth lecture video on the chapter, uh, I'm sorry, on the topic of early childhood develop, early childhood or preschool, three to six-ish. Um, in the previous lecture, we were talking about, I must admit that was a couple minutes ago for me, um, cognitive development, and I want to carry on on the topic of cognitive development, specifically discussing language development and perhaps get into or just very briefly talk about some of the different approaches to early childhood education. Um, so this slide here, oh, I'm sorry, you, know, you don't see the slide, um, but so there's a slide that in your uh, packet that discusses um, language development, and it specifically includes um, a variety, a bunch of phrases, a bunch of terms associated with language development. You may remember back in one of the theories on chapter, uh, one of the chapters on theory, we were talking about Norm Chomsky. And Norm Chomsky was a linguist, amongst other things, and one of the ideas that, Nor that Chomsky had was he argued that that people were born with this, what he called a language acquisition device. And he argued that language, and I think others probably agree with this phenomenon, with this concept, but that language is um, a universal, it's a human universal. And that the language acquisition device was a brain structure that was uh, designed or its purpose was solely for the development of language and or and the development and the use of language and he pointed out that all over the world that people have that language has a similar structure and that children learn language and they learn syntax and they learn grammar so you know your, your book makes reference to that by, by the time a child is three they have already learned things they've already learned plurals and tenses and possessives and they've not had any formal grammar and Instruction. that a child as early as six years old will be using you know thousands of words but he'll be understanding like tens of thousands of words and the the phenomena that children learn language so very quickly that's referred to that's the term in your textbook that's referred to as fast mapping and fast mapping simply is the is the phrase given for that all a child needs to do is hear a word one or two times and they already use it it's already part of their vocabulary so it, it lends support for this idea that our brains are set up to learn language um, there is a there are some structures on the left hemisphere the Wernicke and the Barocca structure and I talk about this in my psychology class but when these regions of the brain are damaged a person will lose their ability to produce speech or lose their ability to use use speech um, in, a in, a, in a way that makes any sense. Like they can make all kinds of words, but they're all just sort of random words. And it's interesting that these structures are implicated in the use of spoken language, but when they're damaged, the individual also can't write. They also can't create written language. So the, the implication is, is that, or yeah, the implication is, is that these brain structures are not about speech per se, or reading per se, but they're about this, the use of this symbolic um, system with which we communicate that we call language. Um, so also in your textbook, there's reference to some other language concepts. Uh, you've got a concept called private speech. And what is private speech? It's just a fancy, it's your textbook term for when children talk to themselves. And we all use private speech. I think the quiz question is, why do children use private speech? They use it for the same things that some reasons that adults do. You know, they're trying to problem solve, they're trying to work things out in their head. Sometimes, you know, we say, well, let me see if I have to, you know, we, we literally solve our problems by talking out loud to ourselves. Um, or they might be trying to self-regulate. And what that means is they might be trying to to process their own emotions. You know, I mean, I, you, you probably, I mean, you've seen people that get angry and they walk away rah, 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 talking out loud, right? So adult kids use it for the same reason that um, children use it. And sometimes it's simply to practice. And sometimes it's simply just to use words, you know? I mean, you've heard me say, oh, that's a fun word to say. Or, you know, in a previous video, I was trying to, I had practiced the use of, oh, golly, and I forgot it again. And Ernest, ah, you, you, Unisys, that's not it, but it's the word for, um, 
bedwetting, right? So sometimes it's just saying the words. I know that when I was a kid, I used to listen to myself say the same word over and over again, but then anyway, private speech. Then there's something called um, pragmatics, and pragmatics is simply the practical use of speech that children learn or they're learning during this stage how to have a conversation. And what's also, what, what's interesting is that not all the same way when we were talking about theory of mind, how when a child doesn't have show signs of understanding theory of mind, it may indicate that there's some other cognitive issues. Uh, this is characteristic of autistic kids. So are the pragmatics of speech. I mean, one of the things, one of the sort of hallmarks of people on the spectrum is they don't understand that someone's not interested in what they're saying, or they don't understand, you know, when they're doing all their talking that it's time to stop and let the other person say something. Um, you know, my son has got a whole handful of autistic uh, adult friends, and it is interesting how even at 26, they'll come over and they'll just talk, 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 you know, and, and if I try to talk, they'll just talk right over me. So they don't, uh, it just, and again, that speaks to that theory of mind kind of thing. Then you have a phenomenon called social speech, and social speech simply refers to when we use speech for social purposes, when it has, when it serves a function, and, and it's about speech is about being understood and understanding other people. They're the same way when we were previous in the, previously in the chapters talking about the social class, the phenomena of social class, how that um, predicts or is implicated in obesity and poisoning. It's the same thing when it comes to speech. And I don't, I don't want to suggest that it's about money um, because it's not strictly about money, but when people are engaged, when the adults are, when adults' occupation is one where they use words, they're more like, which are traditionally higher educated, higher paid professional kinds of positions, they are also more likely to use words with their children. And that's all the research says, is that professional occupations where you use words, right, that those, uh, those parents use more words, not only work, but they also use more words when they're talking to their children. They're less likely to use words like stop and no, or because I told you so. Language, <clears throat> when I was talking about these brain structures, how they were implicated in, in producing speech, but they're also implicated in, in the use of written language. Um, sim using speech and vocabulary is considered, and this is in your textbook too, is considered an emergent literacy skill. In other words, pre-reading. So when children learn, uh, when children learn language, they learn vocabulary. These are some of the skills that they will take then with them when they go, when they move to actually reading, right? Um, because reading is a form of the use of language. In much the same way when we were talking about memory, um, and this, this thing called high elaboration and low elaboration, the same thing is true with speech. And when we use the more vocabulary, the, the, the wider our vocabulary is, um, the, the more words we use as adults, the more words our children are gonna learn, right? The better, and the, you know, one of the things that, that two-year-olds really struggle with, that part of that terrible twos that we talked about before is, it, 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 one theory, one explanation is for the, <clears throat> for the, um, oh, for the frustration that we see as two-year-olds is their limited vocabulary because, and, and we can talk about this in, in the terms of marriage and family counseling and in terms of social skills, that the more words I have in my vocabulary, the better I can explain myself and the better I can explain myself Theoretically, the better you can understand me, and I'm less likely to feel frustrated if I can get across what I'm trying to say. And when we talk, when that comes up in like conflict, people that have more vocabulary are more likely to win the arguments because their vocabulary is more nuanced and they can explain in more specific details what they're trying to say. So, bigger vocabulary, you know, more speak, more words heard, more words spoken more reading, more opportunity for more words, right? You see the whole, whole interconnection. It's, there's also in this, um, uh, in, your, in your textbook is a reference to Sesame Street. And what the research um, on Sesame Street has, and this has been, they've been doing, I mean, I think Sesame Street's like 50 years old now, right? And a lot of folks have measured the effects of, of Sesame Street. And indeed, the effects are positive. The children who are exposed to Sesame Street, they will learn, they, they will have an enhanced or, I don't want to say superior, but they will have um, 
better uh, language skills, they'll have more nuanced understanding also of social skills, but overall Sesame Street is good. It actually shows positive developmental, cognitive developmental effects on children. Um, I was re see there was a 60 minute story about Sesame Street and how they brought it to refugee children in Syria. And one of the things that you know that they have pointed out about the whole Sesame Street uh, franchise <clears throat> is that it's uh it's a reflection of society right so my mom often tells the story is the first time i saw a, a child of color i said look mom sesame street people because um in the early 70s you you didn't often see you didn't see in children's television shows anybody that wasn't you know that wasn't white um so the point is is that sesame street has is sort of famous for bringing real world events into the world of children you know there's on sesame street they have an autistic child now they have children in, in um, disabled children in wheelchairs they have children being raised by same-sex parents and with this new one that they're bringing to syria they uh, they have children who are experiencing who are refugees and so the it, sesame street is not just about language and counting but it's also about understanding um, and social interactions and learning some emotional uh, emotional intelligence as well and i think i will just stop right here and in the next one we'll talk about early childhood education <laughs>